All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Trisha King Mims. I'm the Executive Director of National Park Partners of Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and Moccasin Bend. On behalf of the Board of Directors, including our sponsor, State Representative Greg Vidal, thank you all so much for joining us for the final installment of our 18th annual Moccasin Bend Lecture Series. First, let me thank the Tennessee Aquarium and the IMAX Theater staff for this beautiful facility and all of their assistance in setting up this series along with the great work they do day in and day out to educate and raise awareness of the importance of our aquatic biodiversity and native ecosystem of the Tennessee River Valley. Special thanks also to Justin Casey and Helm Projects for providing tonight's video production. Locally, your Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park is truly an amazing historic and cultural resource, one that provided more than 81 million in economic impact in 2022, with nearly 1 million visitors coming to our area to experience the natural, historic, and cultural resources found across, ready, two states, six units, 9,000 acres, 80 miles of trails, more than 1,500 commemorative features interpreting 12,000 years of Chattanooga history. I'd like to recognize Superintendent Brad Bennett. Please join me in thanking Brad and his dedicated National Park Service team for their stewardship and care of our local national treasures. Now I'd like to introduce Greg Vidal, who founded the Moccasin Men Lecture Series in 2006 and underwrites these events each year. Greg was a steadfast and generous supporter of the Friends of Moccasin Bend from the early days and the Friends of Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park as well, prior to them merging to form National Park Partners. He continues to advocate for and frequently visit our fantastic national park system across the country. Greg is a board member and past president of the National Parks Conservation Association and among his many other awards and recognitions, was the recipient in 2008 of the highest honor of the former Friends of Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park, the Drew Haskins Award of Merit. Greg currently serves as state representative for the 29th district. Please welcome Greg Vidal. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Tricia, and thank you all for being here. Tonight is the third event in our 2023 lecture series and this will complete our 18th year since we experimented with a lecture series and so I just have to think back how many wonderful speakers we've had over the years and I always want to ask the question how many other than my mother have never missed one in 18 years Fortunately, I can't see because the light's so bright, but I know mom will raise her hand. There may be one or two others, but they have been enlightening, educational, informative, and mind-provoking. And I think tonight will be another one of those exciting evenings. I want to thank all of you who have supported the lecture series over the last 18 years. And as I came in this evening, I saw several folks that uh, were with us in October for our annual Blessing of the Buffalo and the commemoration in, of the Trail of Tears up at the farm in Georgetown, which we were very blessed to have warriors from the Eastern Band with us this year again, which is always a highlight to help remember the resilience of the Cherokee people. Again, thank you for being here, and I want to welcome the chief and his wife, Colleen, with us this evening, and I'll give Trish the honors of introducing him formally but thank you again for being here and welcome, Chief. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Richard Snee's life work has been one of public service, advocating for youth, community building, and cultural preservation. After graduating from Cherokee High School in 1986, he served in the United States Marine Corps for four years. His beloved wife, Colleen, is a citizen of the United Ketoa Band of Cherokee Indians, and he is the father of five and grandfather to 14 grandchildren. Sneed earned his degree from Universal Technical College in Phoenix, Arizona, and holds a North Carolina teaching license in industrial arts. While pastoring for the Christ Fellowship Church of Cherokee for 14 years, Sneed also taught vocational education at Cherokee Central Schools for 12 of those years. His excellence in the classroom earned him, sorry, earned him recognition as the National Classroom Teacher of the Year by the National Indian Education Association in 2013. 
In 2015, Snead was elected Vice Chief of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. On May 25th, 2017, he was officially sworn in as Principal Chief of the Eastern Band and subsequently re-elected as Principal Chief on September 5th, 2019. While in office, Chief Snead's administration was dedicated to exercising the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indian sovereignty, including growing relationships and partnerships. In part, through the service to the Western or WC, sorry, WCU, is that Western Carolina University, Cherokee Center Advisory Board, United South and Eastern Tribes, and the Cherokee Preservation Foundation Board of Directors. Chief Snead has also recently been elected as the Vice Chairman of the Center for Disease Control's Tribal Advisory Committee. Please welcome the 28th Chief of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians, Richard Snead. Yo, good evening. It's so good to see everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it is an honor to be in Chattanooga. My wife Colleen and I love coming to Chattanooga. It's a beautiful city. Everybody's always very friendly. And so it's uh, been an honor just to, uh, to be in town today. We had an opportunity to uh, go and uh, walk a, a section of the original Trail of Tears today. It was very peaceful back there and just very beautiful. So thank you for hosting us and thank you for having us here. My talk tonight is called Culturally Deliberate in the 21st Century. My premise is that culture and values are imperative to the long-term success of any civilization, and that when cultures and values are eroded or abandoned, that the demise of that civilization is inevitable. Recognizing this and returning to our culture and values can restore, sustain, and prosper civilization. Think of culture and values as the fibers that bind the fabric of a society together. Now, I'll be utilizing a particularly dark time in American and indigenous history to make my point, and that is the assimilation period, also known as the boarding school era, and how lessons from tribal res resiliency can speak to us today in the 21st century. First and foremost, we are all human beings. Regardless of ethnicity, culture, language, gender, melanin content, we are all human beings first and foremost. Now, in about seven weeks, I'm going to be 56 years old, and as I was meeting most of you coming in, most of you are a little bit older than me, uh, and I've witnessed many shifts in the, and changes in America's culture. Some good, some not so good. Now, the most concerning to me is the idea that one can look at a fellow human being, and based on their race, we can know whether or not they're a good or a bad person. This is completely false. And we need to recognize and be aware as I'm sure most of you are, there isn't a single people group in the history of humanity that has clean hands, not one. In spite of this, there are morals, values, and ethics, and ideals that are universal across all cultures. And why is this important, and why do I begin here? And it's because I believe that the future of our civilization, that is, these United States and Western, the Western civilization, depends on us understanding the inherent worth of our culture and values. I'm gonna share some dark parts of American history in relation to the treatment of tribal nations. And I'm doing this not to posture my people as victims because we are not, but instead to demonstrate how important culture and values are to every people group. Uh, every opportunity that I get to speak, especially when I get to, to speak to my own people or to other tribal nations and other tribal peoples, uh, I always want to reiterate the point that we are not victims. Indeed, there are terrible things that happen to Indian tribes across the country, across North America, um, but we're not victims. We were victimized, our ancestors were victimized, but they were resilient and strong, and we are still here today. There is no denying that tribal nations were treated very poorly by the United States of America. In fact, dating back to first contact, there are no less than 258 recorded Indian massacres. Keep in mind that prior to European contact, tribes would war against one another and commit atrocities against one another as well as against European settlers. Next slide. At the time of European contact, there were over 500 tribal nations in North America. And tribes had unique cultures and values just like your ancestors did. But thinking back to the fact that no one had clean hands, you can reference a Cherokee warrior named Doublehead, if you've never heard of Doublehead, but who along with other members of a war party participated in the cannibalization of their enemies. And he was also given the name Baby Killer by James Van because he smashed the skull of a small boy during the attack on Cabot Station when they were en route to Knoxville to lay siege to it. 
The question became, when war and the killing is completed, what do we do with the refugees? Next slide. Well, some Cherokee history first. It's important to note that there were initially, that there was only one Cherokee nation spread across seven states. This place was Cherokee land. Tennessee derived its name from the overhill town of Tennessee, which is located in Monroe County. Uh, but as always, settlers wanted land and resources. A little bit of history there. The impetus for uh, almost all acts of war and conquering is land and resources. And those resources may be natural, human, monetary, or otherwise. Today we find three unique Cherokee tribes, three sovereigns, if you will. Uh, first, the United Katua Band, which was mentioned in uh, my bio that my beautiful wife Colleen is a citizen of the UKB. Uh, now, the UKB, they call themselves the early settlers, and this is a bit of a point of contention because the Treaty of 1817, uh, they say that they, they left willingly, uh, first went to Arkansas, and then were driven from Arkansas into then what was called Indian Territory, and Indian Territory, of course, in 1907 became the state of Oklahoma. Um, I say it's a point of contention because... Uh, Cherokee Nation will say, no, that's not true, and the UKB says, yes, it is. I'm married to a UKB citizen, so I say, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, Cherokee Nation, uh, of course, uh, are the descendants of those Cherokees who uh, were placed on the Trail of Tears, forcibly uh, placed on the Trail of Tears. And then, of course, you have the Eastern Band located, located just uh, over the mountains uh, in Western North Carolina, where I'm from. My ancestors were those Cherokees who resisted removal, but also found uh, a loophole uh, in the Treaty of New Echota that allowed us to stay. And also, my descendants were those who entered into the Treaty of 1819. And if you're not familiar with this uh, treaty, each head of household was promised a 640-acre in, uh, individual reservation uh, with the intent that, again, we're going to see this this common thread throughout the history of the federal government dealing with Indian tribes, assimilation that, that those Cherokees would assimilate into uh, the American culture and we would become American citizens. How did this happen? Well, first by negotiation, then by treaty, and then by violence. Next slide. I'm going to take, a, take you back through federal Indian policy through 1934, but before I do that, I want to just kind of read through these because there are two more phases of this that are not listed on here. Um, the main objective of colonization, as, as always, has been the acquisition of resources, natural and human. Uh, 1492 to 1787, this was an era of tribal independence, and I have uh, on this slide a picture of the book, uh, The Rights of Indians and Tribes by Stephen L. Prevar. It's an outstanding reference book uh, if you want to learn more about the federal government's interaction with tribes. Tribal independence, this was an important era because tribes still had numerical superiority above uh, settlers and colonists, uh, and we had the capacity for war. And so during, during this era, tribes were viewed as um, as sovereign nations, and uh, this continued on up into the next era, which was 1787 to 1828, which is agreements between equals. Uh, at the time, the founders of the U.S. regarded Indian tribes as having the right to govern their people as sovereign nations. You can also think of this as a treaty period um, where the United States government engaged with tribes and entered into treaties. Now, we're probably all well aware that every one of those treaties was broken, uh, but all of the treaties were based upon wanting to move away from war, both for the settlers and for the Indians. And the promise to tribes was that they could live in peace and that they would be taken care of uh, if they entered into these treaties. I think this next era is the one that we're probably most familiar with and has probably been uh, the most well publicized in our region, which is the relocation of the Indians, 1828 to 1887. This is the era when tribes were forcibly removed to west of the Mississippi to Indian territory to make way for settlers hungry for land and resources. Uh, this was the genocide and eradication area, and it's when res the reservation system was created. And we're most familiar with this because this was when the Trail of Tears uh, occurred. But know this, it wasn't just the Cherokee that were removed. All tribes were being removed from the southeast to make room for more settlers. Uh, interesting aside, uh, and uh, I guess it's more anecdotal, uh, when I first met my wife, she was telling me, because she grew up in Oklahoma, 
And she would tell me the story about when she was in elementary school. She said, yeah, every year we, we would do this, this, uh, this picnic and we would bring a lunch and we, they would give us a, a blanket to put out and they would blow a whistle and we'd all run and we'd lay our blankets out and, uh, and then we would eat our lunch on the blankets. And I said, you do realize they were having you reenact the, the, the Sooners taking Indian land. I just thought it was ironic. The era that I want to focus on is the allotment and assimilation era. This is 1887 to 1934. Uh, throughout the history of the United, States in, in the United States engaging with Indian tribes, assimilation was, was always uh, either at the forefront or kind of on the back burner with what to do about the Indians. Uh, by 1887, there were already 200 Indian schools under federal supervision with over 14,000 children in custody. The two other eras that I want to, and I want to talk about, I'm going to come back real quick, um, is the termination era. This was, this varies by some scholars, but 1945 to 1960, this was the termination of tribes with the intent of moving Indians into urban areas for education and assimilation. Uh, this is where the term urban Indian comes from, and there are urban, still urban Indian centers around the country today. Then in 1960 to present, this was the era of tribal self-determination. Uh, this was under President John F. Kennedy, who desired for tribes to be recognized as independent nations governing, them, governing themselves. Uh, assimilation was not a new idea. I'm going to come back to allotment and assimilation. The allotment part of allotment and assimilation was the way to get the land back. Um, I, I, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I haven't yet, but Killers of the Flower Moon uh, it kind of speaks to this where all of a sudden there's resources, in this case oil. Uh, how do we get the land back? Well, the allotment era was a way for the federal government to take back reservation land from Indians. And the way they did that was... Um, land would be assigned to individual Indians, and for 25 years it would still be reservation land. But after the 25-year period, then it would become fee simple land, and then the Indians would have to start paying taxes on it. And so the first time I, I went to Oklahoma when I first got into office, I was very confused because when you're in Cherokee, you're in Cherokee, and it's contiguous, there's 56,000 acres of contiguous land. Now we have non-contiguous property, like such as I, my wife and I live on 3,200 acre tract, which is non-contiguous to the 56,000 tribal acres. Um, but I, what I was used to was you go to the reservation and you're on the reservation. When I went to Northeast Oklahoma, it's like you're on tribal land and you drive a couple blocks over, now you're not. You drive a couple, this is tribal land, this is not. This is tribal land, this is not. And I was asking people, how is this? And they said, oh, allotment era. It was the allotment era. And I was like, well, please explain. And they said, yeah, at that time, the land became fee simple after 25 years, and then it could be sold, and so it was sold to non-Indians. So that's the allotment part. The assimilation part is a theme that, that had been in place really since the, the 1700s. In the 1700s, they were called Americanization policies. And the Americanization policies were, we will teach the Indians to stop being hunter-gatherers and instead to be subsistence farmers and become agrarian. That didn't work. And that's why you have removal. Right. Next slide. Sorry. Assimilation, the boarding school era. Captain Richard Henry Pratt. At a speech delivered to the National Conference of Charities and Correction in 1892, he was quoted as saying, um, kill the Indian in him and save the man. And that was really the mantra of the day. What policymakers understood was this. The foundation of any people group is its culture. If you destroy the foundational components of any people group, you destroy the civilization. It's important to note that when this was happening, there were lots of well-meaning Americans who believed that this would be in the best interest of the Indians, and they would do their part to help make it happen. Uh, you probably have heard lots of horror stories of things that happened during the boarding school era. Uh, Canada, you know, this was really brought to national attention just a few years ago when in Canada a mass grave of 220 children was discovered and then subsequently more graves uh, at other uh, boarding schools across Canada were discovered as well. And it, kind of, it brought this to the forefront, not only in Canada, but also in the United States, that this was an issue that had occurred. The ideas 
uh, were central to the creation of boarding schools. Uh, these ideas were central to the creation of boarding schools across the U.S. and Canada, including the Carlisle, Carlisle Indian School in 1879, and of course Chattanooga's own Brainerd Mission in 1817. So again, understanding that if you destroy the foundational components of a people group, that you destroy the civilization, we have to ask, what are the components of a civilization? Well, of course, language, religious beliefs, ceremony, ritual, values, community, food, traditional clothing. Language was a key component of that. Uh, in my own community, when I first got into office back in 2015, uh, I would go to all the community club meetings in the different communities, and there were uh, very aged tribal elders in the Big Cove community. They held their community club meeting uh, in the old Nazarene church. And I had one of the uh, elder men, uh, a man they called Snake Panther, he has since passed on, telling me about how when he was a little boy, and he took me over into the hallway, and he said, they would, they would make us kneel down right here and stand us in the corner, or they would uh, beat us or wash our mouths out with soap for speaking Cherokee. And he said it was a terrible thing. Here's what we know now about what happened. When Deb Holland, who was a former member of Congress, who uh, President Biden appointed as the first uh, indigenous and first female Secretary of the Interior, she commissioned a Department of the Interior investigation into what had occurred at the boarding schools. And the DUI investigation found that children were exposed to systematic, militarized, and identity-altering methodologies. And what does that mean? Well, if anyone who's served in the military understands the methodology, if you're like me, and I served in the Marines, you really understand the methodology. No use of your name. When I first got to boot camp, one of the first things, what first things they do is they shave your head. And they forbid you from using your name. It's this recruit, that recruit, sir, this recruit requests permission. You're not allowed to use, you couldn't use your own name. And then they put everybody in uniform so we all look the same. And there's lots of yelling and screaming and what they're doing is psychologically breaking you down to reprogram you into the person they want you to be in this case in the military, they want you to be a warrior and a fighter. Well, imagine applying that same methodology to small children. Imagine for a moment, if you will, if you were a small child being taken from your parents, say from out west, placed on a train and shipped thousands of miles away to a school, and your head is shaved, and you're placed in a military uniform, you're not allowed to use your language, you cannot practice your religion. First was the removal of traditional clothing, the cutting of hair, renaming, the banning of religious practice, corporal punishment, solitary confinement, starvation, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, and disease. The second to last bullet point there, the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, my wife and I watched um, a short documentary um, about the boarding schools in Canada, uh, in particular the ones that, uh, that were being run by the Catholic Church, and the stories of sexual abuse of both boys and girls was gut-wrenching and heartbreaking. The Department of Interior Investigation findings quoted this, quote, this report confirms that the United States directly targeted American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian children in the pursuit of a policy of cultural assimilation that coincided with Indian territorial dispossession, unquote. As I stated at the beginning, the, the end result or the end game for colonization is always resources, natural, human, and otherwise. What are the long-term negative outcomes? Well, addiction, abuse, mental health issues, high suicide rates, diabetes, and a whole host of other negative outcomes. Uh, Trisha and I both uh, participated in a radio interview this morning that went very well. And uh, when I was asked the question, well, what do you think about like the whole, you know, changing the names of sports teams? You know, what do you, what do you think about that? And I said, well, you know, back when uh, I said the Eastern Band has had a long-standing relationship with the Atlanta Braves, close to 30 years now, and it's been a very good relationship between both uh, uh, the tribe and the team. But, and, and nobody cared about that until the Braves were this close to getting into the World Series a couple years back. And then all of a sudden I was inundated with phone calls and emails. Hey, we want to talk to you. Don't you think the Braves need to change their name? And I said, no, I, I don't believe that they do. And uh, 
we had this, uh, you know, I did, did lots of interviews, and what really shocked me was, uh, man, I, I, I got thrown under the bus, backed over, run over a couple more times in the national press, and uh, I, my wife can tell you, we, we were sitting in bed one night, and the, the Eastern Band, like most tribes, uh, if, if you're engaged in, in politics at all in, in D.C., you have a PR firm. Our PR firm was sending me links to all of the, the comments that were being made about me. <laughs> And it was overwhelming, and, and uh, the negativity that I was getting. But in, in all of these interviews that I was doing, uh, my defense was simple. Uh, I said, you know, sports are simply, uh, you know, sim simulated warfare. Uh, and, you know, you name a team uh, that represents, you know, you name a team after uh, an icon for strength and courage and honor and, and uh, ferocity. Uh, and I said, so no, I'm not, I'm not offended by the Atlanta being called the Braves. Uh, and, but what I told all the reporters was, I went down a list of issues that uh, were facing Indian country. And, I, and that was around the same time that the MMIW movement was really starting to gain traction. And if you're not familiar with MMIW, that's missing, murdered, and, and, missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, and the reason that they're missing and murdered indigenous women was an issue because especially if you go the further out west you go and the more rural or remote that a tribe is, or if they are a state in which the county has jurisdiction uh, when a crime occurs, those tribes seem to be, the women in those tribes seem to be more heavily victimized uh, than, than others. And so I went down this list of negative outcomes and I said, these, is, these have been issues in Indian country for generations, for decades, and none of you have ever reported on it, and none of you care. And when this World Series is, when this National Championship Series is over and the World Series is over, you still won't care. You're making an issue out of something that's not an issue when there's this whole host of issues over here facing Indian country that need to be addressed. When I said that this morning, the radio host said, well, those are the same issues that we have in, in all the other communities. And I said, you're right, but per capita, per person, they're at a much higher rate in Indian country than they are in the rest of the country. But I think it also points to and proves my point that as there's an erosion of culture, and in this case, an erosion of American culture, we see all the negative outcomes that are just continue, continuing to flourish. Now, it begs the question, how does this information make you feel? When I ask that question of people, I usually get responses uh, angry, disgusted, hopeless. All of those are appropriate responses to what happened uh, you know, 100 years or so ago, not even 100 years ago. But there is hope. There is a path to healing. It is an absolute imperative that we understand that we cannot change the past. We can only learn from it. And not only in these larger issues that affect our nation, but in our personal lives as well. Our past does not define our future. We must avoid the temptation to blame the present for the sins of the past. I would submit to you that we live in treacherous times because so many young people today who are, quite frankly, ignorant of history, want to blame the current generation for the sins of the past. This is a fool's errand. The past is our teacher that if we ignore, we are doomed to repeat. We, each of us, has the ability to shape the future in our individual lives, in our communities, and in our nation. And I want to say this, history is complicated. And as I stated at the outset of my talk, there is not a people group in the history of humanity who has clean hands. But we have the ability to shape the future, and the answer to today's problems are not new. They are ancient. We must learn, apply, and adhere to our traditional and cultural values, for they are the anchor for the human soul. We must be culturally deliberate. And what does this mean to be culturally deliberate? For my people, it's returning to our language. I mentioned to you uh, earlier in the discussion that during the boarding school era, one of the main components that was that young people were forbidden from speaking their traditional language. The result of that policy alone, when I first came into office as principal chief, we had, I believe at that time, 272 fluent Cherokee language speakers left in the Eastern Band tribe. Uh, I left office six weeks ago. Uh, we have 136, I believe, 
That's it. Now, I said we have to be deliberate. When I ran for office in 19 and when I won that election, when I gave my, my inaugural um, speech, I promised my people that Cherokee language, not just the preservation of Cherokee language, but the proliferation of Cherokee language would be a cornerstone of my administration. One of the things that I'm most proud of is that while during this last term, uh, we, had, uh, we, we have and still in place a uh, Cherokee language school for young children, but, but to be quite honest, it, it wasn't working to teach little kids Cherokee and hope that they were going to uh, carry the responsibility of preserving and proliferating the language. They, have to have, they needed someone to talk to when they left school. And if there's nobody at home who speaks Cherokee, that meant that the bulk of their day was still all in English. And so what we did was we created two language programs, one in the Snowbird community, which is a, a remote community that's about 50 miles away from Cherokee, which oddly enough has the highest concentration of fluent language speakers in it. We created an adult language program there, and we created an adult language program in uh, Cherokee proper. The Snowbird uh, program is, in Cherokee is Dadi Woni Shi. It means we will speak. And we just graduated the, the first group of graduates from there, and uh, they're going on to teach. And so we're not only preserving but proliferating Cherokee language. And to me, it was one of those things we had to put our money where our mouth is, right? We spend all this money on all these other programs. And if we say that language matters to us, then we need to put the dollars to it. So what we did was created these positions as full-time. It's a full-time job, paid position to learn, speak, and proliferate Cherokee language 40 hours a week, immersed with the, the fluent language speakers. And so that's been a huge success and one that I'm very proud of. Our people are returning to our traditions. Um, they're returning to learning the, the ancient crafts, uh, ceremony, uh, going to ceremony uh, up in Big Cove, or going to ceremony at Kadua Mound, uh, returning to cultural, our, our cultural values. Uh, this was one that I also made a, a real priority when I was in office, to sit down with our tribal elders, and we did these as interviews. And, I hate to call them interviews because it was more like a conversation where I would just sit down and, and you know, there was a list of, of uh, you know, 10 Cherokee core values and, and I would ask one of them, you know, pick a core value and we're going to sit down and talk about it. And our media team recorded those so we have that um, for posterity to basically say, what was it like when you were growing up? What were the values that were impressed upon you when you were a child? And why is that important? It's important now because of technology our young people are not necessarily, or what, what I was seeing as a teacher, our young men especially were not embracing Cherokee culture. They were embracing hip hop and thug culture. And as a teacher, I would say, that's not who you are. That's not your identity. And um, lastly, I think in, uh, in, in being culturally deliberate and what I have seen happen over the last few years is returning to our medicine game, stickball. And uh, that's what you see pictured in the top right. You see even the little kids playing. This picture here in black and white, uh, that's, I think, from like the turn of the century. That's a very old picture. Uh, the Cherokee word for that, the literal translation means little brother of war. And the stickball game was, was played between uh, clans or villages. If there was a dispute, rather than go to war where, where people would kill one another, they would play the game, the medicine game, and whoever won, they were the winners of the dispute. Um, stickball was the forebearer of, of uh, lacrosse, as you see over in that far left picture. That's a picture from the Georgia Swarm, uh, which their owner, John Arlotta, uh, great guy, uh, he's got lots of uh, indigenous players on his team and does an outstanding job. They, do, they host a cultural night every year at a, at a Georgia Swarm game and just uh, an amazing individual who just loves, uh, loves indigenous culture and loves the people and really is doing everything he can to help proliferate uh, traditional culture. So uh, locally, another way we're being culture deliberate, culturally deliberate is our, through our library. And these, these are just a few ways our library is contributing to uh, being culture deliberate. We have a, an entire room dedicated to indigenous and Cherokee materials. So it's a, like a, an indigenous and Cherokee study room. Uh, they, they also have uh, cultural classes hosted by the library where we're teaching traditional craft, uh, teaching genealogy, uh, storytelling, and Cherokee language. I wanna to speak to the genealogy piece for just a moment. Uh, I think it's imperative for all of us, and for your generation, as I stated, you know, obviously most of you are, are my age or older. 
Um, for your generation, most of you probably have a pretty good grasp on your family tree and your roots and where you come from. Um, my generation, uh, you know, I was, I was a, a little kid in the 70s. I was born in 67. I was a little kid in the 70s, teenager in the 80s. But one thing I recognized when I was growing up in the 70s, because I grew up with my, my mom and dad got divorced when I was very young, didn't know my dad, never met my dad. I remember being probably a, about four and finding a picture. And it was a, a very dark complected man with a flat top haircut holding a baby. And I found that picture and I took it to my mom and I said, who is this? And she said, that's you. And I said, no, who's this? And she said, oh, that's your dad. No further discussion. Never knew my dad. When I was 14 years old, I went to live with my dad, uh, which was a huge culture shock to go from New Jersey to uh, Cherokee, North Carolina. And I moved in with three strangers. Prior to that, growing up in New Jersey, Having no connection to any family, I always felt very alone. I always felt like I didn't belong. I always felt like I had no identity. And um, when I moved in with my dad, my dad was, uh, he's not now, because like my, my, my wife's like, your dad's so nice. I'm like, he wasn't when I was a kid. Um, but uh, my dad never told me about my family. He never told me about where I came from. My relationship with my father at that time, well, like now we talk all the time, but at that time, it was he gave orders and I said, yes, sir, no, sir, which served me very well when I joined the Marine Corps um, because when they came in in the, the barracks in the morning yelling and screaming to wake up, you know, get out of the rock. I was just like, Daddy, is that you? <laughs> so it did serve me well. But I always had this sense that there was something missing in here. Uh, I, I, the best way I can describe it is as if there was a piece of, uh, like a puzzle piece missing. And one, one day when I was probably about 25 years old, and at that time I had two children already, um, and I needed a place to build a house, and my father said to me, he said, I've got some acreage up on the hill on Stillwell Branch. I'll give it to you. You can build a house up there. I'm like, okay, great. He goes, we'll go up there tomorrow and look at it. Okay. So we drive up this gravel road. We park, and I look, and I see a graveyard over here. He's pointing out, you know, this is the, the property over here, and I'm like, what's that? He says, oh, that's our family graveyard. I didn't even know we had a family graveyard. Well, come on over here and I'll show you. And for about the next 45 minutes, my father walked me through this graveyard and showed me who my people were. More importantly, he showed me who I was in about a 45 minute span, where I came from and who my people were and what they were like. And on that day, I remember on the drive home, I had a sense of peace that I never had before because that peace that was missing was put in there. And, and see, when I was growing up in New Jersey, I grew up in a time, like for many of you who are, who are much older than me, you remember a time when people didn't get divorced. When I was growing up in New Jersey, I didn't know any kid who had a dad that lived with them. So we've raised an entire generation now that has grown up without this value system about the family and why that's important and why dads matter and why mom and dad together matter and why the family unit matters. So I'm, 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 I'm a big proponent of knowing where you come from, knowing who your people are. Uh, we have external partnerships with Eco Explorer in the North Carolina Arboretum. Uh, they take students out there to teach them about traditional plants. And we also, at that Arboretum, we have uh, a seed bank with uh, Cherokee heirloom seeds in it as well. And we have a Cherokee traditional children's books uh, that are being written as we speak. This is uh, in process. That's a grant-funded project. Next is how our museum contributes. Um, there's really been a paradigm shift with our museum. We, we hired a new director a few years back. Uh, I say young lady, she's probably early 40s, Shana Bushyhead, um, who understands that our story is not just the past, that we're not just a who they were, we are who are we now? And it's the question I always ask, what does it mean to be Cherokee today? Uh, our, our story is not only the past, it's now, and it's the future, it's tomorrow as well. Uh, one of the first things they did, now it's no longer the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, it's the Museum of the Cherokee People. Uh, she is doing a great job transitioning the museum from a place for visitors to a community uh, cultural hub for citizens and visitors alike. So in, in a sense, it's a living museum, a living history museum. It tells our story of the past, but it's who we are right now. There's an, uh, an exhibit that's uh, in, uh, on display right now called Disruption. 
And they are art exhibits by contemporary artists in contemporary formats, in film, in tattoo, poetry, electronic media, fashion, music, and others. It answers the question, what does it mean to be indigenous in the 21st century? We must embrace culture. Whatever your ethnicity, your background, your race, we need to embrace our individual cultures. Living out culture is what has sustained indigenous people in spite of an attempt to systematically destroy us. Today, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. We are still here. But a reminder to the United States of America, and let me say this, I love this country. I come from a family of veterans. My, my father's a vet, my sister's a vet, my brother's a vet, my uncle's a vet, my other uncle's a vet, my, my grandfather was a vet, my great uncle, my, I just come from a family of veterans and I love this country and I still think it's the greatest country on the face of the earth and I believe it's the one country where you can come and if you put in the work, you can, you can accomplish your dreams. Nicholas Gomez Davila said this, violence is not necessary to destroy a civilization. Each civilization dies from indifference toward the unique values which created it. And it is my opinion and my belief that that's where we are today in this nation. We have abandoned our values. We've abandoned our culture as Americans. And we're a nation adrift. We're no longer anchored to a value system. We used to be. It was a Judeo-Christian value system. You didn't have to be a Jew or a Christian. They were just the values that we agreed on, right? was love your neighbor as yourself, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, live by the golden rule. And we've abandoned those at, to our own detriment. And so we all have a responsibility. Because of technology and social media and creative content, there's a very real danger of groupthink. I don't know how many Trekkies I have. If you're a Trekkie, you know what that is. Uh, that's the sign for uh, the, the collective. Um, but there is a real danger of, of groupthink and cultural homogenization where everybody wants to just not be on the wrong side of an issue or not to be perceived on the wrong side of an issue to where we can't even have conversation anymore. Each one of us has responsibility to learn about our culture and our beliefs and beliefs different than our own. Content creators, man, what an amazing opportunity. What an amazing time to be alive. Content creators have an opportunity to tell the story of unique cultures from around the world, highlighting the values that are common to all of humanity. While we may differ in many ways, we have values and beliefs that are common to us all. In closing, some deliberate steps to take. We must be deliberate about knowing our own history, our culture, and our traditional values. Uh, when I say knowing our own history, it's not just, uh, you know, where, where did I come from? Uh, it's where am I from and who am I from? Um, we need to learn our culture, our traditional values, both familial and ethnic. And we must understand that everyone and every people has suffered trauma. There's no one people group that has the market cornered on suffering. Life is suffering. We've all suffered to one degree or another. The issue is, is simply how do you handle that? Learn the lessons from the past, what to do and what not to do. We used to call that wisdom. There's not a lot of that going on these days. Um, but I want to share with you this one guiding, Cherokee guiding principle is this. Treat each other's existence as sacred. Thinking in this way changes how one views the world and, and others and allows individuals to live in harmony with one another and all of creation. It is what we as Cherokee call tohi, to be in balance, to be in harmony. Those are my thoughts. I thank you for being here. It's been an honor. God bless you. Ski. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple questions. I um, can pass the mic around if anyone has a question. Okay, way in the back. Got one up front. Get my steps in. This is a great place to give a lecture because I can't see any of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like to. I like to be able to see everybody and engage, but. Thank you, sir, for your presentation tonight and for your service, Semperfy. Uh, just a question: uh, with the DOI investigation, uh, do you see coming out of that from its findings a uh, discussion on reparations, either from the DOI or from the halls of Congress? 
I, probably not. Uh, this is just my opinion, of course. Probably not, because if you think about the way that um, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is structured and Indian Health Service is, is structured now, most tribes would say, well, yeah, that, that, those were all part of the trust responsibility of the United States government to Indian tribes in exchange for the hundreds of millions of acres that were either ceded or taken forcibly. Uh, so in a sense, reparations have been happening all along. That's my opinion. Uh, so I, I, I don't believe so, and I'm not a fan of reparations because, again, reparations then mean that we're going to require that this generation pay for the sins of a past generation, and I, I'm not supportive of that. Again, we can't change the past. We can only learn from it and, and do better as we go forward. Got a couple over here. Here she comes with the mic. Oh, she's got one in the back there. Hold on. Did you, uh, you said you might re refer to or discuss the appropriate handling of prisoners. You were, I think you alluded to that initially when the settlers, uh, maybe you didn't say that. No, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, I was going to say I have a question, but I don't need the mic. I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry, that's probably well, better. Okay. Um, th this morning's radio interview was absolutely amazing. And your, your thoughts, the conversation was incredible. But I didn't get to ask a question, which I now want to ask. How has it impacted or how do you see it impacting things moving forward now that we have Secretary of Interior Deb Holland in this incredibly pivotal role? And thank you again for your service. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think that, um, you know, obviously having someone, let me say this, Indian country, while we have um, many values and, and beliefs and, and things culturally that are cross-cultural, there are things about Indian, cult, Indian country that are very unique from the rest of the country. But when you talk to other tribal leaders or when you talk to other tribal people from across the country, you find these common threads. Having um, an indigenous person in the Department of Interior, uh, it, it's the only reason I think that that boarding school investigation even happened. Uh, because if, had it not been for Deb Holland being there, I just think that it would not be an issue, right? It would be, yes, that happened, we acknowledge that it happened, but we're not gonna go any further than that. So having, um, having a tribal person in that position, and to me, honestly, uh, I hope that that trend continues. Uh, my opinion, uh, what I would like to see happen is I would love to see um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs moved out of the Department of Interior because the DOI manages land and resources. And so I, when I was, I spent a lot of time in DC doing lobbying work and I would say, Department of Interior, land, resources, animals, oh yeah, and Indians. It's, it makes no sense to me. To me, it would make more sense for it to reside in health and human services because we're human beings. Uh, yes, uh, Chief. Um, I was wondering, um, how much coordination does uh, your um, Eastern Band people of in Cherokee area do uh, coordinate with the people in the Western uh, uh, Band in Oklahoma on these issues about you know the Cherokee Indian culture, language, and all the um, you know the uh, the issues that are concerned with the tribe? Sure, quite a bit actually. So uh, every year we have a tri council. And that's uh, United Katua Band, Cherokee Nation, and Eastern Band. And we'll have a, a, a joint council session. Uh, it's hosted by, uh, it, it moves around. So twice, you know, usually two years in a row, it will be in Oklahoma because UKB hosts it, Cherokee Nation hosts it. Then they, they come here and we host it, host it in North Carolina. Um, on cultural issues, especially on issues of um, uh, historical, I'm trying to think of the, the, the federal law there, but it, it essentially um, like, like what's the archeological issues that, that uh, exist at Horseshoe Bend, the uh, consultation with tribes, depending on where uh, it, the, let's say, artifacts or remains are found, will determine which tribe uh, is responsible for responding to consultation. As far as cultural issues like the Cherokee language, our Cherokee language speakers consortium goes to uh, Tahlequah once a year, and then their speakers consortium comes here. 
I, I, I was uh, privileged to be able to participate in that one year, and it was really amazing to sit around in this room. Now, I couldn't understand any, there was anything they were saying because I don't speak Cherokee. But what they were doing was uh, new words, like, okay, so for example, computer. Well, what's the Cherokee word for computer? So they would assign to individual groups these new words, and they would make a determination of what the word's going to be. And then so they're continuing to expand uh, the lexicon, the, the Cherokee lexicon. So uh, lots of things happening uh, between all three tribes, but mainly between Cherokee Nation and Eastern Band. Right here. Yes, uh, my question would be about Marcus and Ben. Do you have any opinion on Marx and what Marx and Ben is and was and now today? Uh, in relation to the, say, the state mental hospital or in, in, in what context? Uh, one, one year, or not one year, but one time, Chattanooga had an Indian group here, and we went down to Marx and Ben to watch the architects dig up, well, dig up the graves down there. And a lot of people, I would ask them, why are you digging them up? What's wrong with them like they are? They would say, uh, we got to study the bones, we got to study this to find out where they come from or what are they. So right today, they're trying to sell Marcus and Ben. So I'm just asking you, uh, if you haven't, haven't, that much study on it. Uh, we're still studying on Marcus and Banner. Where did it come from? How did it get there? How many people were there? How many tribes were involved? Like you said, there were many Indians in this area before the time. So, That's all. Thank you. Yes, sir. I can't uh, speak to specifically to uh, Moccasin Bend and, and who all was there. To your point about uh, artifacts and, and archaeological digs and, and specifically graves, uh, it is our belief as Cherokee that the graves should remain untouched, undisturbed. In fact, so when, anytime we do uh, any sort of ground disturbance in Cherokee, there has to be an archaeological survey completed. Um, if remains are found, so for example, there was a, there's a parcel of land in Birdtown and uh, we wanted to put housing there. It's, because where we're at, it's, it's very mountainous, so if you can find a piece of flat land, you want to build on it. Uh, we didn't get five yards into the site and grave, grave, grave. Left it undisturbed um, and didn't touch it. So uh, it's our belief and the belief of our elders that the grave should be untouched and undisturbed. Unfortunately, if you think about like what happened at, at Chota and Tanasi back in 75 when uh, Teleco Dam project uh, was occurring, all of there was 90 some graves that were dug up and then put into a mass grave uh, at Sequoia Birthplace. I, that probably would not happen today. But again, there are things that happened in the past that were deemed acceptable then that we say are completely unacceptable today. Yes, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, somewhat related to <clears throat> the issue of Mox and Ben, there are 10 to 12,000 years of different, I'm sure you know this, starting with the Paleolithic and the Archaic and Woodland, Mississippi, and on through that. And some of those, we don't know that much what their language was or their culture, but what advice would you have for Chattanooga and the National Park Service National Park Partners as we uh, try to interpret and make the most out of learning about the, um, that 10 to 12,000 years <clears throat> of history there. I think that really when we look, about the, look at, at issues of, of you know, best land use, we talked about this on, on the, uh, the radio this morning, um, the selling point to me, and I, I hate to frame it this way because we could make the argument all day long that it's, it's historic, uh, and it should, it should be preserved, and not only preserved, but interpreted. Um, my own experience in dealing with the federal government or dealing with state and local agencies is that that doesn't always happen. So a selling point, uh, an economic selling point is, and I think, Tricia, you brought this up this morning, is, is that you know, a, a national park is a destination. If you can develop that interpretively, right, uh, people will come. Um, you know, I, I was kind of surprised that there was a mental hospital on, on the property at this time and, then, and really even more disturbed to learn that, you know, that now there's a discussion like, well, we're going to build more. Um, I would like to think that the, the laws that are in place to protect, uh, you know, artifacts and, and land for historic preservation would protect that. But again, my experience, and, and I shared this this morning, uh, we were off, off air when I shared it, but 
you know, Eastern Band, we had an issue with another tribe coming into North Carolina specifically to take a parcel of land that was Cherokee Aboriginal territory. And there were historic artifacts there and, and, and so forth. I thought, okay, the, you know, the laws are going to protect us on this one, but they didn't. And so we sued, and we sued in federal court. It went to the, uh, the dist federal district court in Washington, D.C. We lost there. We appealed, and then all it took was a member of Congress to, to say, we, the Congress of the United States, do hereby affirm all the decisions of the Department of Interior in regard to parcel number, whatever the parcel number was, and that was it. The uglier part of it was that the parcel was going to be used to put a casino on for the Catawba tribe, and then all of the backroom deals that were made, Lindsey Graham, senator from South Carolina, Chuck Schumer, senator from New York, you explain to me how you get those two guys who are on the opposite sides of the aisle to both co-sponsor that one-page bill and attach it to the National Defense Authorization Act. Real simple. Lindsey Graham's uh, former campaign manager when he was running for president in 2016 was the casino developer. Penn National was going to get the management contract with the Catawba tribe. They're out of New York. Follow the money, as always. And so, once again, and, and it was a shocker to my, it was a shock to my system that in the 21st century, that promises made to tribes and laws that are on the books to protect tribes or to protect their history and their historic artifacts are cast by the wayside whenever the money's involved. I think we have time for one more, if anyone had a lingering. Oh, yes, ma'am. Trisha's getting her steps in. It's all good. Thank you. Um, my question, if I wish to teach a group of young elementary school children how to play kickball and also at the same time teach them the history of how it was used that you were telling us to solve disputes, what is my best source for finding what I need to teach that class? Well, first, uh, stickball is, is not... Is, Keep in mind, it's ceremony. It, okay. it is a game of sorts. Okay. I mean, it's a game. There's no denying that. But it, it, it's ceremony and not one to be. So for example, uh, women aren't even to touch the sticks. Hmm. Um, so you could teach about it, but you could I know about couldn't. war women. What's the, right, but <laughs> the game is, is to be played only by men. Okay. And so uh, I you think can... in that sense, trying to say, well, to get them to play, in, our, in my view, would be unacceptable. Okay. That's the kind of thing I needed to know. I just thought it might be a good way to teach them to handle disputes. Yeah. Lacrosse, you could teach lacrosse. Yeah, they, pl they play lacrosse. <laughs> but, but the actual game, the Little Brother of War, it, it is ceremony. Little Brother of War, okay. Uh, yeah, there is ceremony that goes along with that. Uh, the men are to abstain from any sexual contact with a woman for 30 days prior, uh, no alcohol use. There's ceremony that happens before the game, there's medicine that happens, and there's ceremony that happens after the game as well. This is fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. I have one more quick question. Sure. I hope you're going to tell me you're writing a book. You're about the third or fourth person who says I need to do that. I, I'd I, like I, to pre-order a copy. <laughs> Thank you very much. I all the things it. we've heard tonight, I'd love to be able to go back and read it all now. And so I thought if you wrote a book, that would do it. We shall see. I, I get two things all the time. You should write a book and you should run for Congress. Those are the two that I get all the time. Well, thank you so much, Chief, for joining thank us. You. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Greg, for another wonderful series. And we'll see you next year.